Uh, I'm really honored uh, to get to bring a short message that I pray God will use to encourage you uh, as you begin this journey of prayer. Uh, I've spent a number of times in Korea. My heart uh, is very much aligned um, with what you're doing. I've been influenced greatly in my times in your country. And so what I want to talk to you about is the, the characteristics that make for great prayers. Uh, we can say words. We can come before God, but as I've examined the scripture and have I looked at church history and in my own encounters with people who pray great prayers, I think you can pray and you can talk, but I think there is some very specific characteristics that allows us to break through. You're going to be spending a week before the Lord, and I want to give you some some biblical insight that I pray will refresh your soul, uh, give wings to your prayers, a passion in your heart. And so listen very carefully. Five characteristics of praying, not just prayers, not regular prayers, but great prayers. Number one, great prayers begin and end with God himself. They flow from a passion to know God, more than getting something from God, great prayers have of a passion and desire first and foremost, Lord, I want to know you. I want to be connected to you. I want your spirit to manifest your presence as we're talking and as I'm listening to you. They're not rote. They're not routine. They're not perfunctory. It's not about your performance, about how long you pray. Uh, when you think of Old and New Testament, you hear the prayers, Moses, what's he pray? Uh, Exodus 33, God, show me your glory. I want to know who you really are. David would pray in Psalm 27, one thing I've asked of the Lord, that I may seek, that I may meditate, dwell on the beauty of the Lord. Uh, the Apostle Paul would say, all of my accomplishments, right? Philippians chapter 3. Are, are meaningless, they're garbage compared to the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. In his last prayer, our Lord himself would say, this is eternal life, that they may know you in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And so I just want to encourage you, first and foremost, great prayers are birthed not out of trying to get something from God, but first and foremost, from a heart that's passionate, that wants to know him that wants to experience him. Second, great prayers are not only deeply personal, great prayers are birthed in brokenness. You see, we start with a sense of absolute intimacy that says, Abba, Father. It's the way Jesus taught us to pray, that we, we have access because of him. Uh, we have acceptance because of him. But then great prayers are birthed in, in brokenness. Prayers that get God's attention, that he calls great, are free from self-confidence. They're characterized by desperate dependency and an overwhelming sense of need. It's Moses in Exodus 4 saying, I can't do this. It's overwhelming. It's Nehemiah praying in Nehemiah chapter 1 and saying he weeps. He, he, he says, it, it's too big. How will anything ever happen? It's the sense of desperate dependency and brokenness. You know, the kind of prayers that God listens to are ones that are very honest. It's David, even after his sin. And he says, the sacrifices of the Lord, it's not burnt offerings. It's a broken spirit and a contrite heart. Oh God, you'll never despise. It's in the midst of a, a crisis of his own that Isaiah comes before the Lord in Isaiah 6, and the king has died, and we have crises all over the world right now. And he enters into God's presence, and God manifests his presence, his power, in unapproachable light, his grace. And Isaiah says, woe is me. This isn't about putting yourself down. This is a sense of the holiness of God, the needs of the world, and our own inadequacy, and in coming with this level of spiritual bankruptcy and dependency, no sense of self-confidence, but we come because of 
the offer and the invitation. Our relationship with Jesus allows us to enter in, to come before the throne of grace and find mercy in our time of need. The third characteristic of, of prayers that get God's attention. Great prayers champion God's agenda. God is delighted when our focus shifts from our own world, our own needs, to his world and his agenda. Great prayers are prayed by people who understand God's agenda for his world, and they passionately desire his rule, that his kingdom comes and his will be done. You know, we all have issues, don't we? And we, and we should pray for them. We have needs in our families, needs in our marriages, need about our children, needs in our singleness, financial needs. We have fear, we have anxiety, we have challenges, and God wants us to pray and bring those things before him. But something happens when we get the focus off of ourselves and even off of all the problems, and we begin to align our agenda with God's agenda. You remember, Moses had this great opportunity, and the, the people had sinned greatly. And remember, the Lord said, I'm going to destroy them, and I'll start over with you, Moses. And Moses doesn't bat an eye, and Moses cares about God's reputation. God, your agenda, what about your promises to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob? And, and see, in other words, Moses says, I want your agenda to be fulfilled. Uh, Nehemiah does exactly the same thing. He, he takes the promises of God and he says, I'm living in the lap of luxury. I have a, a wonderful life as the cupbearer to the king. I have plenty of food, I have lots of comfort, but over here, the agenda of God is failing. We see that happening all around the world. And Nehemiah, what did he do? He fast, he prayed, he wept, and then he prayed a great prayer. God, this is your agenda. This is your kingdom. This is what you want done. This is what you said you would do. And that's the kind of prayer that I encourage you to pray, to listen to the Spirit's voice, to, to pray with Scripture and through Scripture and say, what is God's agenda? What would it look like for his kingdom to come and his will to be done first in your life? I often, early in the morning, as I'm just waking up, I will go through the Lord's Prayer. I mean, even before I get out of bed, just in those pre, kind of those dawn hours, and I, our Father, my Father, who's in heaven, holy, high, and exalted, and lifted up, and then, God, I want your kingdom to come and your will to be done. And then I, then I just begin to think through my day and say, will you do that in my life first? Will you do that in, in my wife, my children, my grandchildren? And then I begin to walk through throughout the world, aligning our heart with God's agenda, the way Moses did, the way Nehemiah did, the way Jesus did. Remember his prayer? I think the hardest prayer of his life on earth. Father, not my will, but your will be done. Not for comfort, not to make my life easier, not to get everything to work out that I want it to work out for me. That's a consumer mindset that has eva just invaded the church. But it's your will, your kingdom come, your will to be done. The fourth characteristic of, I think, prayers that get God's answers and get his attention, great prayers take God seriously. Well, what I mean by that is this, is that means God actually means what he says. It means that when we pray, we act on what he's told us. It means that when he promises something, we actually believe he's going to keep his promise. In other words, Moses came before him and he reminded God, this is what you promised Abraham, and therefore I'm standing on that. It's Nehemiah again, praying again, saying, wait, wait, wait a second, you promised that if we were dispersed throughout all the world because of our idolatry, if we would repent, you would bring us back from all around the world. And, and it's interesting. He says, these are your people. These are your servants. These are your promises. This is your agenda. In other words, he takes God very, very seriously. In the midst of even the turmoil, David, absolute failure. He's been confronted by Nathan. 
he, he, he's been outed. He realizes now that the, the immorality, the, the death of Uriah, and he's, he's, he understands he has sinned so deeply. He comes and on the promises of God, he, he, he says, oh Lord, the sacrifices of God, what moves your heart isn't, you know, how many bulls that I could sacrifice or how many sheep. It's, uh, it's a broken heart. It's a contrite heart. It's a broken spirit. And he just hangs on to that promise and he brings it before the Lord. I want to encourage you. Um, take God seriously. When he says, I'll be with you always, believe that. When he tells us you can do all things through Christ, believe that. When he says, as you pray, he will do exceedingly, abundantly beyond all that you ask or think, let's believe that. When, when, he, when he says to us, ask of me for the nations and I'll give it. Let's ask him. Let's ask him to work in Europe and bring peace. Let's ask him to use the church in Korea to, to be revitalized, to see the kind of revival that we saw decades ago, to see a purity in the church in Korea, in America, in Africa in South America, in Southeast Asia, in, in, in Russia, in China. Let, let's ask God to do what he longs to do. And let's be those people who stand in the gap before him for the land. Do you remember that passage in Ezekiel chapter 22? Verse 30 says, I searched for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand in the gap before me for the land. He was looking for an intercessor. And I think it's the saddest verse in the Bible. It says, but I found no one. This is what you are going to be doing. This is your holy calling. Verse 31 goes on to say, because he found no one, therefore I'll pour out my indignation. He talks about his just wrath coming upon people because he couldn't find a man. He couldn't find a woman who would stand in the gap and say, Lord, this is who you are and what you want to do. You're kind, you're compassionate, you're, you're, you're loving kindness, you're slow to anger, you're abounding in love. And here's the needs. I'm asking you, I'm standing between these. I'm asking you, I'm coming before you. I'm believing that your heart, your compassion, that you want to exercise now. And for reasons I don't understand, and I don't think anyone does, he chooses to use intercessory prayer to bridge and allow the grace of God and the work of the Holy Spirit to move supernaturally in the hearts of men and women, of leaders, of nations. And finally, number five, uh, great prayers demand great courage. What I mean by that is this, is that great prayers take us to places with God and ourselves that can be a bit frightening. You know, Esther prayed, oh, Lord, deliver us. And God tapped her on the shoulder and said, this is what you're to do for such a time as this. Nehemiah prayed and said, oh, Lord, what's happening? The walls of Jerusalem, I mean, they're burned with fire and your agenda is failing. And God tapped him on the shoulder a few months later and said, I want you to be that person. We need to pray. You need to pray in a way that you are willing to be the answer to whatever prayer. And it might start with something small. It might be in your own life. It might be just forgiving someone. It might be dealing with something hard. But great prayers demand great courage. And then finally, I, uh, I summarized this entire message in this way. Great prayers ask the improbable, expect the impossible, and receive the unthinkable because of Jesus. Because of Jesus' command, we boldly ask the improbable, right? Ask, seek, knock, Matthew 7, 7 and 8. Because of Jesus' promise, we expect the impossible. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask that you might receive, that your joy will be made full. And because of Jesus' power, we receive the unthinkable. Ephesians 3, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all that we could ask or think how, according to the power that works within us. That's our calling. May you in this season pray great prayers for the glory of God.
the good of Korea and for all the earth. Thanks for the chance to share.